<clears throat> All right, welcome back, everybody. I am super excited today because my um, guest and fellow artist is beautiful Rebecca Devaney. Rebecca shares my passion of embroidery like nobody else I've ever met. And so I'm really, really looking forward to um, an interesting uh, discussion today. Now, a little bit about Rebecca. She is a textile artist, researcher and facilitator. She has a BA um, and an MFA from the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. Rebecca has also had amazing um, history in and work history in couture. She graduated from the beautiful um, Ecole Lesage School in Paris. And then everyone listen to this. She has worked for Yves Saint Laurent, Chanel, Dior, Valentino, Givenchy and Louis Vuitton. So if that's not a resume, I don't know what is. Um, her work has been published. She's done a lot of um, she loves history of uh, hawk couture embroidery and has published that work internationally. What Rebecca's doing now, and we're going to find out more in our discussion, is she is taking, um, inviting people to join her on textile tours of Paris, where she takes a walking tour of groups of people and she shows them all the special magical spots in Paris. Um, haberdasheries, flea markets, you know, thread suppliers. She's also teaching online classes um, and has recently um, launched a beautiful range of embroidery kits, which we are going to talk about. So welcome, Rebecca. I know you're busy and thank you so much for making time for this discussion today. Thank you so much, Crystal. I'm very excited to be here today. It's always a pleasure to chat and especially about embroidery. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, I do not know where to start with you. So let's start with, with your time working as a couture embroiderer in Paris. Tell, tell me in the audience whatever you would like to share about that part of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I it had been my dream since I was 18 to go to Paris and train as a whole couture embroiderer. <clears throat> And I had very romantic ideas of what it was going to be like. So <laughs> um, a lot of those um, romantic kind of fairy tale notions were dispelled with um, when I was doing my training at a Lesage. So it took six months uh, to qualify as a professional embroiderer. Mm -hmm. um, I was working about 16 hours a day. Um, embroidering hundreds and thousands of beads and sequins. Um, but despite the challenges, I absolutely loved it. Um, so I asked my teachers, how can I continue this? How can I continue working as an embroiderer? Because they were saying that once you kind of have the basic techniques in hokage embroidery, it's actually about gaining experience with materials. Mm. And that's how you develop as an embroiderer. And the best way to do that is in the studios because they buy all the materials. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the system now in Paris is a contract work system mainly. Mm -hmm. um, and there are three recruitment agencies that specialize in hokage embroiderers. So I signed up to all three. Um, I love it. And, yeah, <laughs> I just thought I'd hedge my bets. Uh, and uh, so you do these very, you're, when you start off your career, you do very short uh, little jobs. They're actually called missions in French. So my first mission was for Chanel. Oh. Um, yeah, so it was a wonderful start. And I spent three days in a very small room with eight other people. Wow. <clears throat> and I was actually called in for a feather working job. So feather workers are a completely different kind of, I suppose, craft. Mm. Um, and they train for two years in France and then they get their professional qualification. But when there's a shortage of feather workers, they call in embroiderers. Yeah. So I was on hand uh, <laughs> to do that. And then my next little mission was for Louis Vuitton. Mm -hmm. And that was 10 days, I think. And we were making a dress uh, that was actually worn by Beyonce. Uh, wow. 
wow so you saw your work on a Hollywood star I know I know so that was I kind of felt like well I can kind of stop now yeah you, that was a quick a quick uh, rise to the top wasn't it yeah and I'm a huge Beyonce fan so anyway I kept on and my next job was for Yves Saint Laurent and um it was between collections and we were making the gowns for the Met Gala Ball mm -hmm. and the Cannes Film Festival. Wow. Yeah. So my contract kept being extended and that's what you want. You want your contract mm -hmm. to be extended so you can build up your reputation, I suppose. Um, and I was there for 10 weeks. Yeah. And uh, I used to ring my granny on the way into work. I'm like, I'm going into East Saint Laurent. <laughs> Um, and it was, yeah, there was a lot of learning there. And then I saw a lot of the gowns I was working on, I suppose, at the, on, in, in magazines and things like that. Yeah. Um, for the, and that was lovely to kind of have a sense of, oh, I actually wow. added that sequin. Yeah. Um, and uh, then I went on, as my reputation developed, um, it was possible to start working in, uh, to, to work in Lesage, in the Lesage mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. So that was fantastic. And the way that Lesage works is that they, you know, they take in work from Chanel, they do the embroidery work for Chanel, but then they also do the embroidery work for Valentino and Givenchy and Dolce and Gabbana. And obviously each house has very different styles mm. and very different materials. Yes. Um, and then finally, uh, I was called in to work at Atelier Vermont uh, and Vermont began in the 1950s and they did a lot of the embroidery for Christian Dior yeah. and uh, they have these wonderful videos online um, and I've probably watched them all several times <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was really for me it was the most I suppose authentic uh, experience you know it, it you have all these beautiful embroidery books and art books in the lobby and the artistic mm. directors working with the drafts people yeah. because it's a separate team who do all the designs and the drawing and they have their beautiful stock room, which I'd be peeking into and wow. never going into. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> off limits. Um, and then a lovely kind of atmosphere in the studio with the fantastic uh, head, Premier d'Atelier. Mm -hmm. So for me, the highlight of of my career as an embroiderer was definitely working at Atelier Vermont. Wow! Yeah. Did it feel surreal as it was as it was opening? It yeah, completely. Like I, there were times where I was kind of because you know my 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 previous life was obviously create. I was an art teacher in Ireland for eight years, um, and. It was, I just, I think because I've been thinking about this since I was 18, I kind of, I guess when it became a reality, it was hard to actually digest and mm. to understand, oh yeah, I'm making a dress for Catherine Deneuve yeah. uh, or Beyonce or Lady Gaga or, mm. you know, all of these, uh, or uh, the Princess of Monaco, you know, um, so it was kind of, it was surreal and, and, and it took me a while to kind of, uh, I suppose accept and celebrate what I was doing mm, yeah 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 I, I think that happens to many of us that you know we start to realize our goals and we're super excited and happy but it does take a little bit of time to just to adjust and to kind of embody it and and make it real for yeah yeah absolutely and then there was you know there was another interesting aspect to that in that, you know, I was telling people who I was working for and what I was doing and all of that. And it all sounds so glamorous, but it's actually very far from glamorous. Like it's a highly, highly pressurized situation. Mm. It's not as creative and enjoyable as when you're doing embroidery yourself at home. And, yeah. um, you know, because embroidery is the second to last step in, in creating clothes before the runway collections. And so you have, you know, you're working on your embroidery, you're using your timbre hook, um, you have to be exact to the millimeter, mm -hmm. um, otherwise it all has to be taken out or you're fired. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're under a lot of pressure. And then you have somebody behind you saying five minutes, four minutes, three oh my minutes. Oh goodness. 
Yeah, so it's not as kind of that's what I'm saying. This fairy tale romantic idea I had was was not the reality. Yeah. Um, so as much as I loved it, uh, there were definitely challenging ch challenging times. Um, and also it's it, it's quite poorly paid. Yeah. So that was um an eye opener as well. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard this from other um people who have. Um, worked in yeah the big fashion houses as well and it was really a gift for me because it had always been my dream but living in Australia I thought how am I possibly going to make that happen and when I heard the reality of it it was like oh I've been so blessed that you know I didn't actually go down go down that route so so that was a huge learning curve really great experience and then you decided to move forward take us to the next chapter of your life yeah absolutely well I so I think what obviously I have two real interests in embroidery um one is obviously you know the beauty and the creativity and the artistic side and then the other side is, is about all of the stories that are revealed mm -hmm. when you start literally pulling threads um so I had previously done a very big research trip to Mexico to kind of um, ex investigate uh, the cultural significance of hand embroidery across the country. Mm. Um, and this had been an interest of mine since I worked as an art teacher. And when I would have students, as soon as we started learning creative embroidery through art, um, students would start chatting, like really quiet students would start opening up mm. and really, we'll say, energetic students would quieten mm. down. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> and, yeah, really great. And it shifted the dynamic in the class and it was that physical act of embroidery. Mm. Uh, invited people, girls, because I was teaching in Ireland, so girls and boys are separate, so it was the girls. Um, <clears throat> started to open up and be more intimate uh, about their personal lives and similarly in Mexico the women spoke about how their embroideries express their emotions and memories and experiences yeah. and <clears throat> excuse me I had a lot of time on my hands between collections in Paris and I started to go to the library to find out the stories behind whole couture embroidery yeah. um, and I found that there was this vast kind of ecosystem of craftspeople um you know not just embroiderers and lace makers and seamstresses but also bead makers button makers and um, the list went on and on and a lot of the times they were women mm. and it was really hard to find their stories yeah. um uh but i kept i'm very curious so i kept on going <laughs> And as I was doing that, I realized that there's this really interesting geography around haute couture fashion in Paris. So you had all from the 19th century, you had all of these amazing fashion houses uh, around opera with Charles Frederick Worth and mm -hmm. the Cayo Sir and, and then later on Elsa Schiaparelli, which we're all celebrating, who we're all celebrating now. Yeah. <laughs> and Coco Chanel and so on. Um, and then moving away from opera towards Le Sentier, uh, which is still in the second uh, arrondissement, you had all these districts that were separated by crafts. Mm. Um, so like a flower making district, uh, artificial flower making district and a feather working district and a hat making district and embroidery and so on. And they still kind of, to a certain extent, they still exist today. Like you have a little concentration of embroidery studios and a, constant there well there used to be concentrations of uh, flower makers and so on mm. so I thought that there might be like-minded people uh, <laughs> who would be coming to Paris and looking for these places to to buy you know wonderful materials and mm. um, but it being France I suppose the 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 haberdasheries and the notion stores aren't great at advertising or promoting they tend to kind of it's it's up to you to come and find them yeah so I didn't want people to be coming to Paris and missing out on them mm. um so that's why I set up textile tours of Paris so um I bring people on these guided tours to five 
um, haberdasheries in Paris and uh, or, well one the like Ultramod which is the oldest haberdashery we start there they opened in 1827 wow. so they're almost 200 years old <laughs> wow. um, and then we go on to Annie Bouquet who is uh, the queen of needlepoint in France and then you know different stores that specialize in different kind of materials more so ribbons and silk threads and so on um and then to complement that i on when i had time off uh and i wasn't in the library i would go to the flea market mm. um so it took me a very long time to figure out where the best stalls were for vintage textiles and fashion and you know little kind of tools that we might need as embroiders well need as a is an interesting desire desire I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me desire covet must have um <laughs> so i then set up um a, a flea market tour which is on saturdays and that's to visit all the vintage textile and fashion specialists in the oldest flea market in paris Oh. which again opened up a couple of hundred years ago with being Paris. Yeah. Um, so that's where the the textile tours come from. Um, and I'm very passionate about it and love sharing all of the treasures and things that I don't think, I feel sometimes that people never threw out anything in France. Yeah. So you have this wonderful treasure trove of, you know, scissors, thimbles, uh, little sewing kits from the 18th century made of gold wow. you know yeah. yeah um so yeah so I love it so I just think you are a living resource for <laughs> people like me and embroiderers all around the world who just love 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 this and I so I have actually experienced that because the first time I went to Paris was nearly 25 years ago and I got lost I was near Montmartre I was walking around the back streets and I found uh excuse my French but passementre store yeah. yeah all it sold were tassels and fringing tiny yeah. little store beautiful not warm and friendly people when I went in you know palivore and glacial play mm, you know not so much and yeah. <laughs> I just started pulling out I was going to take home as much as my credit card would allow me to carry so yeah. once they realised I was there to shop, not just to look, they became extremely friendly. And we started <laughs> by writing numbers on a piece of paper, how many metres, how many euros was this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I came out of there with my heart and my soul singing. Could I find that shop if I ever went back there again? No. This was long before the internet, long before GPS, long before I had any conception of ever returning to Paris. But... Oh, it was the treasure. It was the highlight of my my holiday there. It was like, and that was one, you know, yeah. and they, it was a hidden gem. I just happened to be lost walking past, saw it and thought, oh, my God, I'm going in there. You yeah. know, and I was very intimidated uh, by the French people with my lack of, of mm. French, and yeah. I was determined. It was like they weren't friendly. It's like, no. I want to buy, you know, these beautiful products. I'm not giving up on this. So you are a godsend to people because <laughs> you are that bridge and you have the knowledge, absolutely. Yeah, so when you were yeah. first talking about the research and the libraries, I'm thinking, mm, when's the book coming out? I know. Well, the book is, because I, I started uh, last year doing this series of, online talks about the history of, of haute couture and craft in France called Textile Tales from Paris. Yes. So people signed up and they listened to me chatting away about all these things. Um, and a lot of the material from that came from, I have been writing this book for probably about four years. So it's, it's a case of actually sending it out to a publisher or an agent. I mean, it's pretty much done uh, and it's, and then I guess, you know, the idea, you know, sometimes what I need to, it's it's a case of finding a publisher who will understand what I'm doing, because I still 
you know, would meet people who kind of think embroidery. Mm. Who'd be interested in that? Yeah, say thousands of people. Yeah, love and it. The beauty of our yeah. world nowadays is you don't need a publisher. You can self-publish, and you can sell your books on Amazon. You can skip that whole step thanks to the technology and the world has changed. So, because yeah. I know I would be first in line for that book, and I know many, many other women that would be standing right behind me. Oh well, I will let you know as soon as it comes. Beautiful. <laughs> we'll do another. We'll do another chat to talk about the book launch. All right, I'll hold you to yeah. that definitely. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. <laughs> all right. So let's also talk about your new collection of um, gorgeous custom-made embroidery kits. Yeah. Well, I think they kind of they they they're born out of this kind of love for embroidery but also for quality materials mm. and um craft and what i so during during the pandemic um i moved from in person embroidery workshops to online um which i wasn't too keen to do initially you know i love the interaction with students um and i you know, I, you know, as much as I'm giving to students, as a teacher, you're receiving, um, you know, when you see people enjoy themselves and so on or progress. So I had some very enthusiastic guinea pigs who are former students and they were saying, Rebecca, this is actually better than in person because we can see it big up screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I adapted. But what I realized was that I was sending people out these long material lists that not everybody could get the materials mm. I was recommending. And when I'm teaching either in person or online, I always say, look, thread is going to be, it's a difference of one euro or three euro for a really good thread. Mm. So why the really good thread? Like it's it's not a huge, you're not investing in a in an electric bike. Yeah. You know, there's small amounts. Um, and the difference of using, say, you know, a really good quality cotton thread, which is almost like silk, mm. or then if you move into using a silk thread, well, you know, it's pretty hard to go back to cotton. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's trying to say that embroidery is, I always say to students, like, it's a pleasure. It's a sensual experience. You're, you're surrounded by color and texture and and, and you're expressing yourself, cre yourself creati creatively. So why not invest in good quality materials? Anyway, that was, pardon? Absolutely. I, I'm completely on board with that because I don't see, well, especially working in couture, I don't see the point of working for hundreds of hours on a piece and using inferior products just for the quality of the end result of the garment. But also yeah. for me, it's the pleasure. Yeah. Of working with beautiful quality tools you know even if you never finish the piece of embroidery you've had this amazing I would call it a spiritual creative experience you know working with colors that make your heart sing feeling yeah. the silk thread work through you know the way it pulls through working with a handmade needle I love antique needles if I can find them because I buy the old-fashioned ones because uh, they're yeah. just made um, made beautifully and so yeah I absolutely am 100% on board with uh, the pleasure and the beauty of working with um, quality products yeah absolutely and also I realized that you know it was quite easy for me who's living in Paris in France to say no no get these threads or this scissors and so on and it's it's not easy for everybody they don't have access um and the other aspect about that is that often like the finest quality materials are made by these craftspeople who have centuries of savoir faire that have been passed down through, you know, generations of the same family. Yeah. And they struggle, you know, because our, we tend to go for the bargain rather than investing. We've changed so much as shoppers. Yeah. Um, and even our approach to, to the craft has changed quite a lot. So I became sort of what I already was. There was a good basis in being passionate about this. But I started talking to craftspeople and saying, listen, is there a possibility of, you know, ha including your materials in these kits? And what's your what's your passion around the, what you're making? So, mm -hmm. you know, I was going around talking to 
um, scissor makers, needle makers, embroidery hoop makers, linen. Linen was one of the hardest things mm. to source. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in Europe. I'm in Northern Europe, you know, the cradle of linen. Um, but now the linen industry has been, you know, for the last hundred years, it's just completely crashed. Yeah. So trying to, you know, I managed to source a family run business that cultivates, harvests and weaves all of their linen in Italy, actually. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Graziano. So, you know, and the father is 80 years old and oh, still working. Yeah. Because he's so passionate. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that I have my favorite threads here. The Overa Soie. Soie yeah. del Chine. Yes. Yeah also one of my <laughs> favorites I love it <laughs> and again you know family-run business they're in their sixth generation they supply all of the threads for whole couture mm. so that's that's the other thing that's interesting about Paris is that you can buy the same materials mm. as a as you know somebody who's doing embroidery for pleasure as you know Chanel and Dior and Hermes um so they're they're accessible to us and then again everything is 200 years old because it's france and the needles <laughs> hold on hold on let's just, let's just stick with the you need to talk about the shop because the pictures of you in the Obaraswa's shop is just like <laughs> i know well I'll, yeah so i'll return to Obaraswa. so i think Obaraswa is sort of my natural habitat um... <laughs> <laughs> your birthplace almost i love it <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Overa Soie is the last stop on my guided tours. Mm -hmm. And it's, they're usually closed to the public, but people, they're only open to professionals. Yeah. Um, but as part of my guided tour, we get to go inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really is like stepping back in time. Yeah. And you'll have seen from the pictures, like yeah. floor to ceiling boxes filled with threads. Yeah. And the boxes have these lovely little labels on them. Um, like and you can see the history, the history oh, yeah. everywhere that you look. And the first time I saw the picture, because I've been using the threads for years here in Australia, and it was yeah. like, oh, my God, it just made my heart sing. So I completely <laughs> understand why you feel it's your natural habitat. So <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And like the even those boxes that you see on the shelves, they're the original boxes that's just amazing like they when they're getting new when they've run out of a thread color or range or whatever it is they yeah. send the boxes and to the factory and the but then the boxes are sent back like everything is you know ancient and traditional and so on so yeah and i mean original wooden floors original wooden countertops antique okay. cash registers Love you know that. it's just stunning and you have all these lovely kind of muted you know the brown wood and then the gray boxes and then when you open things up they're color. just so color, yeah. color, color. yes <laughs> so sorry i interrupted you go back to the needles on to the needles <laughs> oh yeah so the, the, in in the embroidery kits then i'm i'm using silk threads mm -hmm. because i'm trying to a lot of people are kind of nervous or hesitant to use silk threads because they feel like they're going to be very tricky to use yeah. so i want to you know, encourage people to start using these silk threads, mm. silk embroidery threads. Uh, now these are spun silk. So yes. you've spun silk and flat silk. So we start with spun. Yes. Um, and uh, and then the needles then as well. So the needles are made by Boam. Yes. So they hear that here. A favorite, yes. I know, yeah, who's 200 years old. And like, this is how it is in France. So these needles have been awarded the Entreprise du Patrimoine Vivant, so EPV, which is very prestigious. And it's a it's an award that's given by the French government for a company's continued contribution to French heritage and culture. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, and like these tinsy tiny little needles have won this really prestigious award. Um, so I just love that. Yeah. Um, and then I always in my teaching I've been teaching uh, embroidery for 20 years now I, I always used to say almost 20 years and yeah. now it's 20 yes. so, you've hit the benchmark <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um and I suppose like I learned 
from my teachers and so on in school and we always use these lines mm-hmm. um you know I would get students to draw on lines and then they follow the lines and <clears throat> that's how we learned our stitches my, I would always every year I would teach my you know t- teenage students six new stitches yeah. but by the end of their six years in secondary school they would have this dictionary of stitches yeah. and that's what I used to kind of always say to them so this is what I mean by this very kind of linear approach Beautiful. and then when I was doing the online classes during COVID I was sending off this pattern with all of these lines to all my students who would very diligently trace out the lines and I thought yeah. gosh wouldn't it be great to have those lines printed so that mm. my students didn't have to spend hours diligently doing that so I found a screen printer, a hand screen printer in Paris Mm -hmm. and went out and explained to him what I wanted to do. And, you know, the usual embroidery. Who would be doing embroidery? I said, again, thousands of people. (laughs) All around the world. All around the world. It's this international craft. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And he was saying, you want these little dots? And I said, yeah, I do, I do. And he's like, but anyway. So I said, just trust me. So he trusted me. And then again, like like the like um the box I'm going to show you now, he became just as passionate about the project as me. Oh. So this is what it <laughs> looks like in the oh, wonderful. In the hoop. Yeah. yeah. So there's these tiny little dots. Because I know people get kind of worried about at the beginning, because we don't have enough confidence. So we're worried, is our stitch the right length? Is it the right size? Is mm-hmm. it the right distance? So you don't need to worry about that. The dots are there yeah. um, and it I, helps you kind of go along. Your I embroidery. call those training wheels for my students. Here's the training Absolutely. wheels version. Until you can <laughs> build your confidence and then we'll take the training wheels off and you're, you, you're to ride all by yourself. That's it, yeah. Like I always used to say, like when these would be finished, I'd say, this is your dictionary. Yes. And now you need to go and make your own thesaurus. Yeah. Like you yeah. need to go forth yeah. with confidence and play and explore the stitches. Yep. Um, you gave so them the gift of language, their own visual language. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's, and that's, this is the lovely Graziano linen from Italy. Beautiful. Yeah. And then the instructions in the box were have hand drawn illustrations by me one of my secret pleasures is drawing embroidery stitches oh beautiful <laughs> yeah and then one of the you know really fabulous pieces is this loco scissors so it has the little stork um and loco is based in Thiers in France mm-hmm. so there's two scissor making cities or regions there's Thiers and then there's Nogent so I was contacting the scissor makers in Nogent and I had lovely chats with the scissor makers and their wives and their children and so on and the two most famous scissor makers are in their 80s and they're retiring wow. and they have no apprentices mm-hmm. because they were saying um that young people I mean, I suppose if they did have an apprentice, they would be in their 50s or 60s. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people weren't interested in investing the time, you know, the seven, eight, however many years it takes to become a master scissor maker. Yeah. So I realized that I wouldn't be able to source my scissors in no Um, And so I looked up Loco. And Loco is, it's a relatively new company, like they're 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's run by this team who realized that, you know, scissor making is, a, I suppose, a dwindling craft. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just became, it's a team that are extremely passionate about scissor making. So they bought up all of these old machines and brought in craftspeople to retrain them so that they could revive and preserve and continue the craft of scissor making. I just love that. That makes my heart sing like you wouldn't believe. Love it. I know. And I think so that like only in France because you have people who are that dedicated and passionate yeah. about continuing the heritage of scissor making. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it came, you know, time to choose my design, I went for the stork. Mm-hmm. Um, so the stork uh, tells a lovely story um of how traditionally midwives used to bring a piece of needlework with them when they were accompanying women 
during the childbirth process you know because sometimes oh, it will be long that, I've, I've had many pairs of stork scissors and I didn't realize there was a story behind it oh absolutely and it's all about you know women and needlecraft and you know uh creativity and childbirth and so on mm. and sometimes when the midwife was finished the piece of needlework they would give it as a gift to the mother oh, as a memento. Yeah. yeah and then obviously the scissors would also be used to cut the umbilical cord yeah um so yeah so I love that story um and I think it's a beautiful story about women um, mm. and how we support each other and accompany each other mm. um so that's all of the treasures inside the box and then the <laughs> embroidery kit itself wow. will come in these boxes here. Yeah. So this is the first one. So it's called A Brief Dictionary of Stitches. <laughs> so it's edition one, like a book. Mm. And there'll be many more editions to come. Each edition will be limited because it's, you know, it's small craftspeople. So you mm. can't ordering huge numbers mm. um so yeah limited edition and uh each each edition then will have a different theme mainly based on vintage french embroidery designs from the 18th century mm -hmm. and so you know when i get distracted from certain research and the library i go off and you can access very easily these stunning hand-drawn embroidery designs from the 18th century that are just sitting in the museums and archives it's just we amazing have, i know and you have that you know you obviously you need to wear your gloves and things like that mm. but they have the, the hand uh the hand written notes by the embroidery designers like what sequence to use what beads to use what threads to use um and I just think there's such a wonderful kind of literally treasure trove of creativity and art and really, I mean, high levels of design yeah. and we've forgotten. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I just thought that it would be lovely to introduce a very high, you know, high level of, you know, vintage French designs into the embroidery kits and I could use them as a way to teach people. But I'll get to the teaching in a minute. And we'll go back to the box. <laughs> so the box, the box, the box um, has been made by the same box maker that makes all of the boxes for Chanel, Dior, and you know, Ladere macaroons. Wow. <laughs> and I think he's a little bit more excited about these boxes than me, which is hard <laughs> to be. Um, and he can't wait for, you know, because this is the first box, so it's in a Rococo pink and raspberry. Um, but the future the boxes, as the collection continues, each edition will have a different design. Oh, um, lovely. Yeah, and they'll be all kind of illustrated and patterned and things. So, and they'll, you know, sit on your shelves like a traditional book, or oh. they can sit on your, on your uh, desk. So desk. I can just see the boxes becoming the collector's items of the future, regardless of the beautiful embroidery and the tools that are inside them. Everyone's just going to want the box. I know I'm here hugging it because um, <laughs> I have looked like there's, there'll be more kind of things to come with the boxes. But yeah, I, they really for me now, they are very much an item of beauty and it's, you know, Italian paper and mm -hmm. this beautiful grow green ribbon and there's a little magnet in there to keep it closed. I mean, this is the most discussed and considered and designed and prototyped box. So oh, I love it. <laughs> there's a lot of love in there. And I know embroiderers, but I know I do anyway. I love boxes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's where, where that's coming from. Especially for um, those of us who have multiple embroidery projects on the go, you know, Rebecca's <laughs> kit needs to be in that special box. Crystal's kit needs to be in that box. The next <laughs> kit, you know, we all often, I have very few students. I have an occasional one who will have to finish one project before they can start the next, but I'm a Gemini. So I have 10 projects, minimum 10 projects on the go and more, you know, more being planned. So yeah. A beautiful box for each one is super important, I think. Yeah, that's it. I'm glad you can see my way of thinking here, Crystal. Definitely. <laughs> um, and then, like I was saying there, the idea of teaching. So this kit has come from this course that I've effectively been teaching for 20 years in person and online. 
but I had the real honor actually um, of recording the whole course. The course is five hours long <laughs> um, and we do 16 embroidery stitches. And I recorded the entire course at Overeswa. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. So surrounded by all those stunning boxes and, you know, antique furniture and things um, and using obviously the Overa Swat threads. Mm -hmm. So with each kit, there will be a self-guided online course to accompany it. Um, yeah. yeah. And though my idea now is that in the initial when each kit is launched there'll be a special offer a special period or a period of having a special offer where you can buy the kit and then you get the self-guided online course for free mm, um, wow yeah yeah and it's just because i know people learn differently so mm -hmm. you know some people are happy to have a kit and follow the instructions and some people you know want to have that human kind of encouragement i'm very encouraging all the time on the video yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other, yeah and then the other thing about it being recorded is that we have these wonderful close-ups yes i mean i've never seen a bouillon knot in so much detail yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah and, look, so and similar to you i was incredibly reluctant to start teaching online i was you know traveling around the world before um before COVID and teaching only hands-on and I knew other people artisans who were doing it and it was kind of on my to-do list but I was resisting it but I have to say that you know COVID forced me into filming an online course and starting to teach online and there's pros and cons but I just love the way it's opened the world up I have students all over the world I can now live in Australia and I don't have to travel which yeah. A huge blessing and I think it's true because everybody does learn differently and when you mm -hmm. have an online teaching course as the student you can watch the parts you don't get time and time again and the close-ups if you're in a room full of people and there's 10 students around you you can't get that close and see a slow motion it's like oh this is you know so both of us were we're dragged kicking and screaming into the world of technology. But now that we're both there, I think we can admit and see the benefits. Yeah, I think that's it. As a as a teacher, it's hard to let go of the person to person. Mm. Um, but the benefits for students are exponential. You know, even the slow motion button or watching things over and over again. And yeah. I guess, yeah, we have to just accept that and embrace it. And, yeah. and celebrate the gifts you know sometimes there are little glitches with internet you know coverage and things but mostly yeah. I just think it's it's um transformative and amazing um yeah. and before we wrap things up I just want to touch on the thing that I've taken away most from our beautiful conversation is I just love the fact that you are cherishing this amazing craftsmanship and history that you have access to in Paris. It is such a unique thing. I don't think it exists anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And yeah. my personal intent and hope for the world, and I'm seeing it more and more, is that people are slowing down. And I think that was one of the many gifts of COVID. We stopped yeah. the busy, hectic life. We were forced to go internally. And then we kind of going back to our roots, you know, being in the garden, being in nature, so many people took up a creative, you know, embroidery, painting, drawing, whatever it is, knitting, crochet, and it's returning to that um, that slow lifestyle that feeds our soul in ways yeah. that we don't fully understand. And when you were talking about, you know, watching your students, you know, teenage students change and transform just through the art of stitching. And um, I love the stories of women. Every group I've had anywhere in the world, I'm amazed because you gather a diverse range of people, women, yeah. and they sit in circle or they sit together and they stitch and they find a common, common bond. Yes, it, yes. It brings people together. Um like nothing I've I've ever experienced anywhere else in life. And so I love the fact that that slowness, the craftsmanship, because uh, really for me that's what 
Besides the beauty which drew me to couture embroidery in the first place, it was the craftsmanship, the artisan part of it, you know. We're not just doing cross-stitch on a kit and following painting by numbers. We are creating our embroidery on the spot. Um, and I just think that is incredibly important to most people to have that that high level of spirituality, you know, spiritual creativity, I call it. It brings it all together for me because I do think we access a different energy when we're lost in the rhythm of stitching, when we're using beautiful threads, cutting our threads with beautiful scissors that, you know, weren't yeah. made in China and mass produced that only work for three months and then you can't cut anything with them. You know, you yeah. invest in quality tools and they last a lifetime. It's a completely different mindset to the world we come from, but I do believe there's a turn. You know, people are moving to the country. People are realising that they don't need to work 40 and 50-hour weeks for what, you know, that the real value of life is the process that we go through every day and finding beauty in the everyday. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I think, I think it's actually been wonderful. I mean, during kind of the mm -hmm. lockdown, you know, I live in a very small studio in Paris, a little shoebox. Um, but I had each corner set up with drawing, embroidery, reading, because yeah. I knew I'd, you know, need to keep myself occupied. But also, I mean, it was it was it was sort of a wonderful experience of just yeah. relaxing and yeah. doing really creative activities every day. And kind of I realized that these are actually these are all the things that I love yeah. and I don't make time for them because I'm too busy yeah um and I think it was a wonderful opportunity for us to see and think maybe we're just going too fast yeah you know yeah and it's there's so much information that we're taking in all the time on our phones on the tv outside yeah. and you know this this time for you know doing something sensual creative where we're into our spiritual flow and time passes and we don't realize it's dinner time and you know um they're actually what feed our soul yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. couldn't have said it better and I just think so many people discovered that for the first time possibly in their lifetime because we've just been conditioned to work 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 be busy go out do this do that run here run there and there's yeah. so much to benefit from just slowing down and really working out what is important. What lights my heart up every day? What lights your heart up? You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? I'll jump out of bed at 6 a.m. knowing that I'm going to work with a particular thread that day or a particular silk yeah. or I'm going to make beautiful flowers for a garment. And I know that a lot of people think that's completely nuts, but Everybody has to have a passion, something that lights them up, that connects us to that real, you know, flow state. Um, and so yeah. Yeah, my choice is embroidery, so is yours. But whatever your choice of creative outlet is, it still does exactly the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's nourishing. Mm. Um, and that's, I agree completely because we were kind of in this nonstop automatic, you know, where we're consuming. Yeah. all the time rather than actually investing be it in ourselves or in beautiful embroidery threads or in the yeah. time to go and take a walk by the beach and now we see those we see how much how much we actually need them now yeah absolutely and so you know the layer that you're bringing on top of that to create you know to keep these artisans alive to give another generation or a few generations um to the beautiful history that's there just just adds that extra layer for me and I so want the box obviously you know <laughs> there's gonna be so many people who want your kits um and I will include all of um Rebecca's details in the the comments below so that you know where to get your own box with the beautiful kit and the scissors and the threads <laughs> and the Italian linen um because I think it will really um resonate with many people who also love what we love yeah 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 oh absolutely yeah if you like you know even at the box you know a lot of people said you had me at the box yeah but you know, <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot more there's all stories and mm. craft and we're investing in something when we invest in the box we're investing in ourselves and in craft and preservation so yeah. yeah yeah 
it just <laughs> it, it's just beautiful I can see a whole new future of you know people's living a, a slower life but a more meaningful life and you know growing their own food and eating organically and stitching their own clothes and yeah taking the pleasure in the everyday finding the beauty in the everyday things yeah absolutely yeah look forward to that <laughs> thank you so much for your time you are such a blessing to the world and I feel so privileged to have had this time um speaking to you um and I look forward to kit number two and the beautiful box number two and um yeah the next exciting adventure well thank you so much Crystal and uh, thanks for having me on I'm very excited to be part of this um, and also thank you for bringing this to people around the world it's wonderful oh, um, and for connecting us as well yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. Um, and I think embroider is often embroider alone mm. it's a solitary sport so it's great to be able to to let us know that there are other passionate like-minded people so yeah. thank you oh my pleasure and see there's my gift from COVID having to learn how to use Zoom has now transformed <laughs> my life and one thing led to another so let's see where it where the future takes us so thank you so much and I look forward to um, speaking to you again sometime in the future okay thank you so much bye 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 bye, -bye.